Hi, this is Chase Thompson, pastor of First Baptist Church of Central City, and we are so glad that you are streaming this sermon today. We provide these sermons online so that you can have the opportunity to hear and be reminded of God's Word at any time. We also hope these sermons will provide an opportunity for you to share the message of Jesus with others. Basically, we hope these sermons will build you up and lead others to know Jesus. That being the case, please know that our prayer for you is that you would be plugged in and involved in a local church. God calls us to be a part of a local body of believers under the care and leadership of local pastors. These sermons cannot replace that. So if you don't have a church home, we would invite you to come and be with us at any time. At First Baptist Church of Central City, we would love to have you. And thank you again for tuning in. May the Lord be with you. Amen. Wonderful to be together to worship the Lord today, and we are so glad that you all are here. Now open your Bibles, if you have those, to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. If you don't have your Bibles, we will have that on the screens available for you as well, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, we read through 2 Corinthians 10 all the way through 13 in its entirety, because really it's all one big cohesive thought. Uh, we covered the setting and the context of these four chapters. It was a lot of fun, so I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, if you weren't here, go on our YouTube channel, look up our live stream from Wednesday night, and give that a watch or a listen when you can, because this whole section of Scripture, these last four chapters of 2 Corinthians, absolutely fascinating. Uh, it's a very real, very raw, very emotional section of a real letter written by a real person to real people. Uh, I could talk about it for hours. It's one of those sections of scripture where the context comes so very alive when we read it. Uh, so again, I just think that you would really enjoy and really benefit from watching that live stream if you get a chance. And it'll help you to make sense of some of the things that we're going to talk about this morning and in the coming weeks as well. Uh, but with all that being said, this morning, I want you to imagine something with me for just a moment. Imagine you had a dear friend or maybe a dear family member who you loved very much, and you constantly got together with this person. You all always sat together at church, and imagine that one day that person started acting a little strange, and pretty soon that person started being really hateful when you called and really hateful when you texted them, and they stopped coming to church with you. And then finally, you learned that this person had joined a cult. And in this cult, they were taught that they needed to cut off personal ties from you because you were a Bible-believing Christian. Well, that's not the circumstance here in Corinth, okay? But what has happened is that these false teachers, these con men who Paul ironically refers to as super apostles, have come into the church in Corinth claiming to be apostles of Jesus Christ. And they're very flashy, very braggadocious, very well spoken. They have letters of recommendation from other churches. They have a reputation that they're more than happy to tell you about of the ways that God has been so very good for them and has poured out his favor on them. They like going around to churches and telling people that they should follow Jesus the same way they do, and they gladly receive money to help with their ministry. And because they don't want anyone to mess up the con that they're running, they use fancy-sounding arguments, and they make it clear to the church in Corinth, hey, that Paul guy, he's not a real apostle. We are. That's why his life is so difficult and why he's constantly going through all these different trials. Don't be like him. Be like us. Oh, and by the way, we accept cash, credit, check, or Venmo. How do you respond when you have loved ones who fall for something like that? How should we respond when an entire church falls for something like that? Do we just let it go? Well, to each his own. I guess he's happy in the cult. I guess they're happy living by the prosperity gospel. Why should I say anything? Or do we go to spiritual war? Church, we go to war. We destroy falsehoods and we champion the gospel. And that's what Paul is doing here with the Corinthians. And so we're reading this opening section of his letter from 2 Corinthians chapter 10 this morning. I'm going to try to read this exactly as it was intended to be read. This is dripping with 
irony. Paul's going to use some sarcasm here to get his point across. So I want to invite you to stand with me now in honor of the reading of God's Word. Uh, Those who are able, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 1. And it says this, Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent, I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. You are looking at things as they are outwardly. If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ's, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame. For I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. For they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech is contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when absent, such persons we are also indeed when present. For we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. But when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond our measure. But within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. For we are not overextending ourselves as if we did not reach to you. For we were the first to come even as far as you in the gospel of Christ. Not boasting beyond our measure, that is, in other men's labors, but with the hope that as your faith grows, we will be within our sphere enlarged even more by you, so as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond you, and not to boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another. But he who boasts is to boast in the Lord, for it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for this, your word, and Lord, we thank you for this time together. And God, I pray now that you would give us, by your Holy Spirit, understanding of your word. Lord, that we would be able to apply it to our lives. God, we pray for your grace this morning. I pray for your grace as the preacher, that you would help me not to be a distraction to your word. God, I pray that you would help us to lay our burdens at your feet now and to receive your word, to be able to give our ears to hear it and listen to it and be changed by it. And God, we pray through this time together that you would prepare us to serve and give glory to Jesus Christ throughout our lives. God, we love you and we thank you and we pray again that you be with us now. Open our hearts to your word and it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to look again at verse 1. In verse 1, Paul writes, Now I, Paul, myself urge you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I who am meek when face to face with you, but bold toward you when absent. An accusation has been made against Paul by those who are in Corinth. And here in verse 1, what he is doing is he's quoting what they have said about him when he refers to himself as the one who is meek when face to face, but bold when absent. Paul's enemies in Corinth have made him out to be a wimp. They say he writes bold letters, but when he visits, he is weak and unimpressive. He talks tough at a distance, but face to face, he cowers, and then he hurries up and leaves. Paul responds in verse 2, I ask that when I am present, I need not be bold with the confidence with which I propose to be courageous against some who regard us as if we walked according to the flesh. Essentially, Paul says, Just wait till I get there. He pleads that they not force him to be as bold as he can be, while at the same time saying, let's see what you think after I come to you this next time. Verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. In verse 3, Paul makes it clear that as Christians, we don't wage interpersonal spiritual war in the same way the world does. 
The world believes in brute force and in dominating opponents. Many in Corinth would have thought that Paul was weak because he didn't publicly humiliate or physically punish those he had addressed in his letters. Paul says we walk in the flesh, meaning we live and breathe in the world just as anyone else does, but we do not war according to the flesh, meaning as Christians, we don't use sinful tactics to persuade people. In Christ, we are never to simply dominate another person and bend them to our will by sheer force. Rather, we rely upon the power of God to change and influence a situation, speaking his word boldly, faithfully, and unflinchingly, but knowing that God is the one who is at work in lives and in people. In other words, if you have a dear friend who is rebelling against Christ or who is living in sin that they refuse to repent of, Rather than growing hatefully angry toward them that they're not living the way you want, you grow angry at Satan for his deceit. And then in God's power and on the authority of God's word and by God's love, you contend with that person to repent. Now in verses 4 through 6, Paul is going to use language that would have been very familiar uh, to his day about how we wage warfare. Look at verse 4. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but divinely powerful for the destruction of fortresses. We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And we are ready to punish all disobedience whenever your obedience is complete. In ancient warfare, when an army would lay siege to a city, they would use a threefold strategy. First, they would tear down the strongholds. Second, they would take the people captive. And third, they would keep control and influence over the city by crushing any uprisings. Paul says he and the true apostles used the same intellectual, spiritual strategy when laying siege to a rebellious church. Verses 4 and 5, we destroy fortresses. Verse 5, we take captives. And verse 6, we punish all disobedience or further rebellion. Understand, in our lives today, we will encounter spiritual warfare. Especially in light of our age in which there is so much confusion and denial of the truth. Church, we have, lit, we have moved uh, from our culture from a place where we have had a philosophical argument that all truth is relative. Meaning what's true for you is not necessarily true for me. To applying that idea to real unchanging, objective truth. People today deny the very order of God's creation, thinking that they have the right to choose for themselves who and what they will be. That it doesn't matter what God has ordained by His will as evidenced through biological and ontological realities, but instead what matters is how we feel on the inside. We live in a culture of moral and intellectual insanity. And so if I wake up tomorrow and I proclaim that I am a giraffe, and I expect you to refer to me as a giraffe, you have absolutely no moral right to tell me any different. Church, in this type of culture in which so many people are lost, and are seriously making these types of arguments, not knowing the difference between truth and delusion, we, as followers of Jesus Christ, who are called to share the gospel so that people might be freed from the power of darkness, we must know how to fight spiritual, intellectual battles. And the way we do that is by destroying fortresses, taking captives, and punishing all disobedience. What exactly does that mean? We've already read that we don't fight our battles the way the world fights its battles. We don't use brute force and dominate our opponents. This is talking about something else. So let's take it one step at a time. First, we destroy any false argument or any prideful idea that keeps people from knowing God. Church, the truth of God's word is powerful and it is logically consistent. Look at Hebrews chapter 4, verses 12 and 13. 
It says, For the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Everyone in the world has presuppositions and assumptions or philosophical foundations about how the world operates. But God's word is the ultimate presupposition because it is true. This is why you'll find that moralistic atheist arguments against God's word immediately cave in on themselves because the morals that they appeal to, their very concepts of good and evil, of right and wrong, are Christian understandings that are derived from the word of God. Now, we may find ourselves in a situation where we don't know what to say because we don't know the word or we are weak in the word. But God's word stands on its own, and it knocks down any falsehood known to man. Any objection or critique to the Christian faith can be destroyed by the word of God. Second, we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. That means that any idea we encounter, we make that idea subservient to Christ as the ultimate authority. Now, we do this both offensively and defensively. In terms of offense, this is discipleship. It's helping those who have been converted to surrender their every thought and idea to Christ as Lord. We know that Jesus suffered and died on the cross as our substitute for sins. And after he died, he was buried. But on the third day of his burial, he rose from the dead. And anyone who repents or turns from their sins and believes on him will be saved. But when a person truly repents and believes on Christ, that person has received him as his or her Lord or King or Master, meaning they have forfeited their lives in order to live for Jesus. In terms of defense, we have to make sure that we take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. The battle against sin starts in the mind. When a sinful thought or idea crosses your mind at that moment, as a Christian empowered by the Holy Spirit, you must take that thought captive. James 1, 14 and 15 says, But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. At the moment sin crosses our minds, At the moment of temptation or trial, we must take our thoughts captive so that all of our thoughts will be subservient to our Savior. And third, we punish all disobedience. Now, what does that mean? Well, what Paul means here is quite serious. He's speaking in his authority as an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul tells the Corinthians that after they've had a chance to respond, all those who have not repented, all those who remain in disobedience will be punished. And we find out later what he means is that Jesus Christ is going to pour out judgment on the church in Corinth. For us today, it means this. When a Christian remains in unrepentant sin, we practice proper church discipline. Jesus told us how to do that in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. Jesus said, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That means remove that person from the church membership and treat them as you would an unbeliever, meaning assume they are lost and try to win them to salvation in Christ. What we want more than anything is for them to be saved. This is what it looks like when Christians fight our battles. Our battles are always fought in love. Look at verse 7. Paul says, you are looking at things as they are outwardly. 
If anyone is confident in himself that he is Christ's, let him consider this again within himself, that just as he is Christ's, so also are we. For even if I boast somewhat further about our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for destroying you, I will not be put to shame. Again, our battles are always fought in love. Meaning that we seek the salvation and the building up of others. True biblical love always desires and works toward God's best for the other person. And so when Satan would assault a person with wicked ideologies and ideas, we go to war in the power of Christ and on the authority of his word. Paul is saying in verse 8, I have true authority as an apostle, but my authority isn't for destroying you or dominating you or holding power over you. It's not for my sake, as it is for so many who hold authority in the sinful world. No, the Lord gave us authority for building you up. And so something else he wants them to understand about his letters is that he was never hoping to frighten them. He wrote out of genuine love. He wanted to build them up by correcting them. How many of you have memories of being in trouble growing up and being afraid of your parents when you got in trouble? Raise your hand up high. Okay, yeah. I got a lot of those memories. I got a lot of those memories. Uh, There's one time in particular, I think I may have told you all, some of you about this before, but I don't remember what I did. I was eight or nine or ten years old, probably didn't do anything. It was probably a totally unfair situation where I was being persecuted as a child. But eight or nine or ten years old, I'd done something, and I decided I was going to run from my father, run from him. And so I was in the living room, and I was running around the couch, and I had little bitty eight, nine, ten-year-old boy legs, so I could cut really quick, and he had grown man legs, so I was able to stay ahead of him, almost lapped him at one point. And finally, I just stopped in the dead center behind the couch, and I was staring at him in the dead center in front of the couch, and I said, you can't catch me, old man. Yeah, can't catch me, old man. My father smiled at me, and it looked like the smile of the devil himself. He then jumped over the couch and grabbed me by my shirt collar. And like I said, 8 or 9 or 10 years old, next thing I remember, I was 16. So I don't remember what happened after that. But, but we've all got memories, right, of being afraid of our parents because we did something we knew we should not do. But here's the thing, okay? Loving parents, let me emphasize that. Loving parents, loving parents, never had it as their goal to terrify you. Their their goal was never for you to walk around in fear of what they might do. Their goal, because they loved you, was to build you up. It was to raise you right. It was to keep you safe. And therefore, when necessary, it was to discipline you when you needed it. You can let your rebellious child play out on the highway all he wants and very likely not reach adulthood. Or you can warn him the first time, spank him the second time, and know he will live to see another day. Church, only one of those options is loving, and it's the one that involves discipline. Look at verse 9. Paul says, For I do not wish to seem as if I would terrify you by my letters. Paul's relationship with the Corinthians is in tatters. But he wants them to know all I've ever done for you. All I've ever said to you was for the purpose of building you up in Christ. Verse 10, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his personal presence is unimpressive and his speech contemptible. Let such a person consider this, that what we are in word by letters when absent, such persons we are also indeed when present. 2 Corinthians was Paul's fourth letter to the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians was the second. We don't have letters number one and three. But he had written all these letters to the Corinthians in an attempt to get them to repent. He acknowledged earlier in this letter that his third letter was a very harsh letter. But in his letters, he was trying to repair their relationship. And he's responding from a distance to extreme wickedness in the church. 
And because of the fact that he tried to be humble and gracious in person, his opponents were attacking him as cowardly. Again, he's bold, went away, but meek face to face. Paul responds in verse 11, just as in verse 2, just wait till I get there. Now, in the coming chapters, Paul is going to defend himself as a true apostle against these so-called super apostles. But it's hard to do that, isn't it? As a genuine Christian, we know we're called to be humble and not to be prideful. So before writing anything else, here in verses 12 through 18, Paul lays out a defense for how he's about to argue for his authority as an apostle. Look at verse 12. Verse 12, for we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. Paul says, we wouldn't dare try to compare ourselves to those who are more than happy to tell you how great they are. He gets serious again. But when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. They're fools. Verse 13, but we will not boast beyond our measure. But within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. For we are not overextending ourselves as if we did not reach to you. For we were the first to come even as far as you in the gospel of Christ. Not boasting beyond our measure, that is, in other men's labors, but with the hope that as your faith grows, we will be within our sphere enlarged even more by you. So as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond you and not to boast in what has been accomplished in the sphere of another. What's that saying? Well, the super apostles had boasted of their ministry in Corinth. And Paul says they have absolutely no right to boast. Paul and his fellow apostles were the ones who had brought the gospel to Corinth and started the church there. Corinth was in their sphere of authority and influence. And likewise, their hope, verses 15 and 16, was that the gospel would continue to spread beyond Corinth into other regions. All the super apostles were doing was wickedly taking advantage of a church that Paul had planted and all for their own gain. Whereas Paul's only ambition was to see the gospel continue to spread. Finally, these false apostles have boasted in themselves and how great they are and how fantastic their ministry is. And so if Paul is going to defend himself as a true apostle, he needs to make sure everyone is clear on what the measuring stick for that is. Look at verse 17. He quotes out of Jeremiah 9. He says, But he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. The super apostles have said, look at all the great things that we have done. Paul is about to make clear all the great things that Christ has done through him. Again, this is very contextual. It's very real and there's a lot of emotion packed into these coming passages. But it's also the inspired, perfect, eternal, authoritative word of God. And therefore, we are called... To respond to it. How can we respond to a chapter of Holy Scripture such as this one? We find at least three applications for our lives. First, we need to fight for the salvation and sanctification of others. And we don't fight the way the world fights, otherwise we might as well be of the world. But knowing that all people in this world are born into sin and that there are lost people. Knowing that wicked and perverse ideologies are so popular in our day. And knowing that atheism and secularism are in vogue in our culture. We must go to spiritual war out of our love for others. That means if you want to truly love people in our world today, you need to ravenously consume Scripture. You need to be prayed up and studied up so that you can give an answer for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. You need to be able to destroy ideological strongholds, to take every thought and idea captive to the obedience of Christ, and to stand firm against unrepentance within the church by practicing church discipline. Brothers and sisters, spiritually, we are not at peacetime anymore. This is wartime 
Now, many of you grew up, myself included, at a young age in peacetime. Peacetime's over. We're at war now, spiritual war, and you need to be ready for battle. Otherwise, more and more people are going to fall to the enemy, and they're going to fall into the pits of hell. Second, we must fight all of our battles with love. There is such a thing, the Scripture says, as a righteous anger. And at times, that righteous anger will stir us up to act and to proclaim the gospel. But we must never allow our anger to carry us over into hatred the way the world does. We share the gospel, and we contend for the faith, and we crush the presuppositions of wickedness because we love other people. And we don't want anyone to spend eternity in hell, but rather we desire that they would repent and believe on Jesus Christ for salvation. We must fight spiritual warfare in love, seeking the good of others by striving to free them from Satan's grasp. And finally, third, we must measure ourselves by how much glory Christ receives through our actions and our words rather than how much glory we receive. Who are you living for? Are you living for yourself? For your reputation? Your social status? Your security? Your glory? Or are you living as a servant of Jesus Christ? Denying yourself, taking up your cross daily, and obeying his every command. Church, we were created, our purpose in life is to bring God glory. May we measure our lives and make our boasts by that standard alone every single day. May God get all the glory. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, God, we thank you for the saints who have come before us, who have been bold to share your word. God, we thank you for the apostles and for their writings which have been handed down to us. And Lord, we thank you for how real and how raw some of these writings can be as real people were contending for those that they love to come to the truth. And God, we thank you most of all that this is your eternal and authoritative word for us today. So we pray that you would help us to be bold. We pray that you would help us to be like our Savior who is full of truth and grace. We pray that you would help us to go out into this community, out to our friends and family, out to this world, to this nation, and share the gospel and tear down strongholds of wickedness that would keep people from knowing Christ. Help us to stand firm in this day where we know that spiritual warfare is all around. God, we pray that you would inspire us and strengthen us by our love for you as we draw near to you and behold your glory every day. Help us to live that our lives would be lived entirely for you. And God, be with us now. Lord, if there's anyone here who needs to make a decision today, anyone who needs to commit something to you, anyone who has sin in their lives they need to turn away from, anyone who needs to receive Christ as their Lord and Savior for the very first time, draw them to yourself, we pray. Use this time for your glory, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.